Hi there, welcome back and welcome for the ones who just joined uh, Programmers Week. Uh, we had a great week with a lot of tech talks and this is the final day, uh, the data and AI day. Uh, I'm Aline, I'm the community manager for mobile and AI communities uh, and I'll be your host today for the AI talks that our AI community will present today. So AI, I think it's a very hot topic nowadays. So that's why we dedicated an entire day for this uh, this talks about data ai because now with the near nearly limitless quantity of available data affordable data storage and the growth of less expensive and more powerful processing uh, we have an increase of machine learning uh, solutions many industries are developing more robust machine learning models capable of analyzing bigger and more complex data while delivering uh, faster and more accurate uh, results on vast scales. And many new develop uh, young developers or uh, developers who uh, wanted to learn this, this field in the past now can do, can do it more easily due to the open source uh, data available, the open source models available, and also the, uh, now the new, uh, let's say, courses and uh, learning materials out there. But an important thing is how do you apply the best patterns let's say machine learning patterns for the right solution and that's why uh, that's uh, why dan is here to talk a little bit about that uh, dan is one of our machine learning engineers uh, in cognizance of vision uh, he is skilled in machine learning and software development in general uh, and he likes uh, covering all the stages of the ml life cycle from data exploration discovery to feature engineering modeling optimization and deployment so then, uh, without further ado, I'll let you take the, the YouTube, the stage, the Zoom, let's say, uh, and uh, let's, us, let's see what, uh, the, what some design patterns we can use in, uh, in machine learning projects. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, let me start by sharing my uh, presentation first. I oh. think it's okay, right? Um, so, hello everyone and welcome. Thanks for joining us for Programmers Week. Uh, I will start by introducing myself to those of you who may not know me. Uh, I'm Dan Dimitriou and I am a machine learning engineer uh, at Cognizance of Vision, where I'm working on machine learning uh, project across different domains and across the entire ML flow, like Alin said, from data analysis to model deployment. Um, I'm a soft, uh, soft visioner for more than two and a half years by now. Um, so today I will uh, really, I'm really excited to show you um, the land of design patterns in the ML domain during and after my presentation. I encourage everyone to share your question in the QI module so I can answer them accordingly. So let's wait no more and get started. Sorry. Uh, here are the topics for today. Um, I will start by presenting my presentation by doing an introduction to design patterns, what they are and what are they uh, useful. And then I will show you uh, how machine learning design patterns can be grouped by type. Then I will go through multiple design patterns and discuss uh, each one. Also, I will give you an idea on what other design patterns are out there, which uh, I couldn't cover, unfortunately, in this presentation. And in the end, we can draw together some conclusion around this um, uh, design patterns. Uh, let's begin with a short introduction to design patterns. At first, uh, a first a question uh, to uh, to that would be um, what are design patterns? Probably many of you heard uh, about them from conventional uh, conventional uh, de development, but maybe didn't think maybe about a concrete definition of them. Well, here is the definition uh, given uh, to patterns when they were first introduced in 1977 in the field of architecture uh, in a very influential book called 
a pattern language. Uh, you can read the definition uh, that I have put here, but uh, that is, it is basically saying that design patterns are describing a core solution to a repeatable problem, keeping the solution in the same time general and adaptable to any particular scenario or problem. Um, another question would be, why do we need design patterns? So design patterns uh, are usually useful uh, because we don't need to rediscover uh, them every time. Uh, basically to have standards, uh, which saves usually a lot of time. Uh, with design patterns, we can solve issues using a proven solution. This yield higher project successes in general. They make overall system easier to understand and maintain, uh, saves again time and the system are more scalable. Uh, and they also make communication, which is another uh, important uh, thing, between design and end programmers more efficient, which leads to more productive things. Next, uh, let us look uh, into what types of design pattern we have based on the steps in our typical ML flow. So as you can see here, we have design pattern related to uh, data representation, problem representation, model training, resident serving, uh, reproducibility, and last but not least, uh, responsible AI, which is basically explainable AI. Um, in the following chapters, because there are many design patterns out there, like I said, and because we don't have uh, time to cover them all, I picked some commonly known, but also some interesting ones. Uh, that I hope uh, you will like. The first design pattern that I will present to you uh, is none other than embeddings, a uh, very used and known design pattern. Embedding is a data representation type design pattern. Um, starting with a bit of context, nowadays machine learning models need to handle multiple type, types of input. We know that. Some of them are more easily to, uh, to handle, like for example, numerical inputs, but with other like categorical features, text, images, um, audio, time series, uh, and maybe uh, and many more things can get complicated. Um, and for those who are working in this field, um, they know. Despite the data type of the input, um, the model has to do the same thing every in every scenario, namely um, systematically look for patterns in the data in order to capture how the properties of the input feature relate to the output label. Um, because it has been shown numerous times that the data representation directly affects the quality of the final model, we need um, a meaningful num uh, numeric value to supply your machine learning model. So these features can fit uh, within our typical uh, training process. Um, so how we do that exactly? Well, this is what embedding, uh, embeddings do. They provide a way to handle some of these diverse data types in a way that preserves similarity between, between items and consequently improve our model's ability to learn these essential patterns. Where exactly the embedding design pattern is giving a solution to the problem of representing high cardinality data uh, more densely in a lower dimension by passing the input data through an embedding layer that has trainable weights. In this way, we map the high dimensional uh, categorical input uh, variable to a real valued vector in some low dimensional space. You can see this uh, in a, the example that I put uh, here uh, in the left in figure A. Sorry. Um, I put an example uh, with uh, N diagnosis. Um, which we will need to input to, uh, to our model. 
um, this is a categorical input and to give it to an ML model, we will need to, to one hot encoding it. We will end up with, but we will end up with an n-dimensional space, which probably is not that bad every time, but uh, which can sometimes be very large, but also uh, it can be sparse, which is um, even worse. Uh, from experience, models don't really react well to such uh, sparse uh, inputs. So, what are we going to do if uh, to do? What we are going to do is to use embedding layer to transform the n-dimensional space to a, a x-dimensional space. Uh, Observer also here in the example. Um, you can look if you look uh, in the in the left in the right um, how the numerical vector are are changed now, right? So the the dimension is reduced and the numbers are quite different. Different. Um, the trainable weights a word also to that um, that enable the dense representation of the input are computed or learned in the optimization process of the model training. In practice, these embeddings uh, end up capturing closeness relations, relationships in uh, the input data. And I will show you uh, this more uh, to easily understand with some examples. You can see here an example of uh, book embeddings and how the different data points with the same semantics, meaning books with similar content, are grouping together. Of course, this is only a, a 2D uh, uh, space and groups are harder to observe, but in reality, this space has many more dimensions. Uh, and here uh, is another example, this time uh, with image embeddings uh, from convolution layers. The, the difference here is that we have different embeddings at different levels uh, within the convolution neural network. Uh, you can see how these embeddings hold different special, uh, spatial pattern information uh, depending on, on the level uh, in, the, in the network, like I said. Um, the second design plan that I will present uh, to you is uh, multimodal input, which is another data representation type um, design pattern. Uh, like we saw in the previous design pattern, a model input can uh, take many forms uh, and many models are defined only to take a specific type of input. And here, I'm sure you know a lot of models even um, that you use daily. Um, but sometimes there are situations where we want or that where we need to give multiple inputs with different data types to the to our models, uh, usually uh, to better capture the overall context, to build a more robust model, and hopefully yield higher accuracy. So, how we handle this scenario? Well, we handle it by first um, um, by first taking each type of input data and representing it uh, in a form that is understood by the machine learning model. And this is uh, and this and this means uh, that for for example numerical values we keep them we can keep them normalize them transform them to uh, categorical um, data a process known as bucketing um, for text we can use embeddings one hot encoding bag of words engrams etc uh, images for images we can use convolutional embeddings. Um, Pixel values, if the um, um, images are small, uh, you know the examples with MNIST, uh, where you pass the pixel values directly to dense layers. Um, and for the categorical uh, fe uh, features or data, uh, we can use one hot encoding and even embeddings like we saw in the previous example. Second, um, and I apologize for this uh, second one. Uh, second, we need to build a suitable architecture with groups, the different data 
representation. I will make this aspect more easy uh, and I will make this aspect more easy to understand with uh, the following uh, example. Um, let's say that we have an electric scooter browsing app uh, and we want to create a model that gives user rating and scores based on how they are parking the scooters. As input, we could take, for example, the location where the scooter was parked uh, in the idea that, uh, well, users who park scoot scooters in strange location will be penalized. Um, the image of the scooter and its surroundings in order to detect if, for example, the scooter has a strange position, it's uh, in people way, it's parked in front of a door or something like that. Um, and also time, date, the date and time, um, in the idea that maybe it's okay uh, that the scooters is parked near homes, at uh, people's homes at night, for example. Um, and to give you a better idea of what I mean with this uh, use case, here are some examples of park scooters. The ones uh, that I will show you in the left um, should get higher scores and the ones in the right should get lower scores. And here's an example of a good park scooter. Um, and in the opposite here is a not that good park scooter. Um, here's another one, uh, a good example. And here another, uh, let's say, epic uh, parking uh, way. <laughs> Um, all right, and so coming back, um, how we would model the three different inputs. As we can see here, the image uh, input will be given um, to a convolution layer. In practice, there will be many con convolution layers. Um, the location and time, although we could have been uh, have treat, uh, treated them separately, will uh, will be given to a dense layer. And now the output of both layers will be uh, concatenated and feed into another dense layer. And then um, we will have the final output, which is our uh, score or parking uh, rating. So that was with this example. Um, the third design pattern on my list today is uh, reframing, uh, which is a problem representation type design pattern. Um, when an ML practitioner starts working on a given problem, usually he starts asking a lot of questions like, uh, is this a supervised learning problem? or unsupervised, or how is the data set? Do we have enough data? Uh, what are the labels? How much error is okay? And the list can continue. Um, we put all this question uh, to better understand the characteristic of the problem that we have to resolve in order to pull um, out the appropriate machine learning knowledge and commit to a path that hopefully will lead us to a good performing machine learning model. Um, this part of uh, assessing the problem, uh, as you might know, is called framing. Now, to better explain the reframing design pattern, I will give you a nice example that I found uh, in the reference book. Um, suppose we want to build a machine learning model to predict future uh, rainfall amounts, for example, 1.7 centime centimeters here, um, in a given location and during an amount of time. The big question, the first big question actually, what type of task is this? Uh, it's the classification, regression. Well, let's think about it actually. Um, because the rainfall amount, um, what we need to predict is a numerical and continuous value, but variable, more correct. Um, one would say it's a regression problem. And yeah, this is correct. 
but others might think taking a second look uh realize that maybe it's better to see this problem as a time series forecasting problem and give the current uh, uh, given the current and historical climate uh, and weather patterns that are available in the data set uh, this is also correct and in theory maybe has even greater potential uh, than the first uh, approach so going forward with one approach, it doesn't matter. As we develop and train our model, we most probably see that um, our predict predicted rainfall amounts are all off. And this is because for the same set of features, it sometimes rains, I don't know, 0.3 centimeters of rain, and other times it rains 0.5 centimeters of rain. Uh, well, in this situation, you may think, well, we have a problem now. Um, the question is what we can do to improve it, uh, to improve our prediction, so to say. Um, so <laughs> what uh, a practitioner and uh, usually does, it's uh, starting again the question loop in his head and uh, he's asking himself, well, uh, maybe I can add more layers to the network or engineer more feature or increase the data set or different, maybe choose a different loss function. All to, 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 to have a better result. Well, all the ideas could improve our model, um, but are the status, the previous two status approaches, uh, the only way we can tackle this week, uh, this task, um, perhaps, we could reframe our problem in a different way that increases our uh, task problem. Um, okay, maybe let's hang a bit more on, on, the, on the problem and shine some light among the clouds here. Um, our bad results come from the fact that the rainfall is probabilistic, meaning that for the same set of features, like I said, it's something rain uh, zero three centimeters in and in other times more maybe. Um, we can resolve this by reframing the regression task to a classification uh, problem. Well, exactly, uh, we establish a discrete probability probability distribution, as you can see here in the table. <clears throat> Um, so that our output will be a multi-class classification giving the probability that the rainfall is uh, within a certain range, so range of rainfall amounts this time. Um, sure, both strategies give a certain rainfall amount, but by taking the task as a classification problem, we allow the model to capture the probability distribution of the rainfall of different uh, quantities instead of having to choose the mean of the distribution in the case of the regression. So, yeah, and this will give us uh, the ranges of precipitation and the probabil probability that, that the rain will um, reside within a given range. Okay, um, going forward, um, the next design pattern in this uh, series is useful overfitting, which is a model training type design pattern. Um, say we want to simulate a, a behavior of a physical and dynamical system, like those found in climate, uh, science, computational biology, or computi uh, computational finance. Um, it's a uh, harder design pattern, so bear with me. Um, in this type of system, the relationship between time and observations uh, can be described by mat mathematical functions, uh, but also with a set of pa uh, partial differential equations, right? So a system which we can describe mathematically, basically. 
Although this equation can define the line, underlying uh, process of the system, like I said, they don't have a closed form solution. So a solution to this um, is classical numerical methods that have been uh, used to approximate the solution of the, of the system. Um, but these methods come with a drawback, um, as you might anticipate it, uh, namely that they are slow when used in practice. So um, let's, discuss, let's discuss more aspects here uh, related to the physical model uh, by look, looking at this uh, diagram. So um, I mentioned that we have observations uh, from a physical environment, which we can use as input uh, for a physical, uh, physical based model in order to compute the precise state of the system using uh, iterative numerical calculation. This is more or less what I said previously. Uh, presuming that all the observation have a finite number of possibilities, example, uh, the temperature is between say, uh, 60 and 80 degrees with a certain increment. Uh, we can define a complete input space of uh, for an ML system, uh, and uh, that will basically represent our physical environment. Uh, in other words, we could create a training data set with, uh, which is finite, having a training um, as training examples, the observation together with the labels representing in the system, uh, the system state calculated, uh, like I said, using the physical uh, model. And using this um, data set, train an ML model, which uh, will need to learn this precisely calculated. And this is important. So uh, need to learn this precisely calculated and non-overlapping lookup table of inputs to outputs. Basically, for a set of inputs, there is only one precisely cal calculated output to, to be learned. In general, the goal of um, ML model is to generalize, you know, you know that, and make reliable prediction on new unseen data. Um, but, and in the case we have overfitting, that means that the model is not generalizing well. But, in this scenario, there is no unseen data that needs to be generalized to, since all possible inputs have been already computed. Uh, I'll let that sink for a moment. Um, and another thing, um, splitting the data set in training and test make no sense either. Either uh, in the case, in this case, because the model would have to predict for the test data something that it hasn't seen in the train data, right? Remember the the, the entire data set, it's a non-overlapping lookup table. So in this case, when building an ML model to learn such um, physical model or dynamical system uh, for that matter, there is no such things as overfitting. ML just provides a data-driven approach to approximate the precise solution. Um, in a contraintuitive way, we actually want our ML model to fit the training data as perfect as possible. We want to overfit, basically. Then uh, we can say we have a, a, a good model. Uh, I also prepared an example, which is quite complex and I am planning to skip it because of sake of time, but maybe we can come back to it. Um, very, very short. It's uh, an example of um, ray tracing used to si simulate the satellite imagery. And um, this simulation has um, some um, models, phys physical models, uh, because uh, we need to uh, calculate how much the solar ray gets absorbed by some uh, uh, hydrometers, rain, snow, and so on. 
And for that, we can use basically uh, ML model um, in um, the, in comparison with the classical numerical methods I put here in the end, because um, the classical numerical methods uh, are taking uh, big computational effort and the ML model with the approximation, it's uh, only taking fraction of the time. So moving, um, moving to another um, interesting design pattern in this series, um, which is two phase predictions, which is a resilient serving uh, type uh, design pattern. Um, let's say that we have use cases in which ML models need to be uh, consumed for from devices on the edge, like cell phones or I don't know smartwatches. Um, what option do we have to model ML uh, to make ML models available for consumption on this kind of devices? Well, there are a couple. Um, maybe the most uh, frequent ones would be these ones. Um, so. At one uh, one method would be to deploy the model on the device. That's possible, um, but good models and complex models are large, and we usually have many device constraints like CPU, GPU, RAM, battery life. Battery life being the top one concern usually. Um, we could make some trade-offs between the model complexity and the size. Update the update fre frequency of the model, the accuracy, uh, the prediction time. This sound, uh, sounds good, but usually users don't really like trade offs. Um, well, well, sure, there are other techniques to make models smaller and faster, but this will not save us too often. So we need to think an, uh, of another one. Another one. Uh, like shown here is to uh, use an ML model in the cloud. So get rid, uh, rid of uh, uh, the problem with the uh, power, with the performance, with how the big uh, how big is the model and so on. But um, here we have another problem, uh, namely that devices cannot always rely on internet connection. For example, you have a smart watch you go in the forest. You don't have really internet connection there. Um, so you might say, well, you use the app or system only when you have internet. That's also pass possible, but uh, the user experience will uh, definitely uh, definitely suffer. Um, then uh, now we can ask our, uh, ourselves, is there a better uh, solution to this problem? Well, there is actually and we can use two phase prediction strategy um, this strategy implies splitting a given problem in two so that we can assign it to different quantities where exactly we will take the simpler uh, part of the problem having a simple uh, model and deploy it to the uh, edge device uh, and similarly, we will take the more complex part, uh, having obviously a more complex model and deploy it to the cloud. Um, one should mention here that it's important in order to apply this design pattern, we will need to have a problem that can be split in two problems, ideally with varying complexity. So we can make this um, placement of the uh, problem problem on the device, uh, respectively, on the cloud. Um, well, and how the, does it work now? Uh, well, the input will be taken by the edge device. Then it will be given to the simpler model, uh, performing an inference, which will usually give good accuracy. Then, uh, if needed, the input will be pass further uh, in the cloud via an internet connection. Um, and over the internet, 
yeah, we're using an inter uh, internet connection, I wanted to say, um, to be given to a more complex model in order to yield a more complex response, which will be sent back to the device. So I also prepared uh, uh, an example. Um, and these kind of devices are like uh, Echo Dot from Amazon, uh, which, which are actively, um, which is, sorry, which are activated by wake word and can then answer to question or respond to different commands, like, you know, calling someone, setting an alarm and so on. Um, and how does it work? Well, the device is listening uh, to, to we, we using the internal microphone. And when you so, say something, the model of the Echo Dot uh, will try to predict if, you said uh, the wake word or not, really. And if it is the case, you, you said the wake word or phrase, hey Alexa, in, in this case, um, then you can ask more complex things. For example, I don't know, a question about history. Uh, the question will be uh, meaning, so not the question is not translating, meaning the sound of your voice will be transferred via request over the internet on a dedicated Amazon server for a more, uh, to a more co complex ML model, which will have the job to predict something usable, hopefully in our case, a good answer. Uh, um, and that model at work on the server side is uh, a question answering model, which is usually complex. And that's why actually it's not, it's on the server and on, not on the device. In the end, the prepared response will be sent back uh, to the device. Another benefit, maybe indirect benefit to this approach is that you, um, you don't uh, hit constantly the network. So you don't constantly make requests to the server. Many of the, the, the processing is done on device. All right, so moving forward. Um, Well, actually, I need to reach my the end of my presentation. Um, and given the fact that, well, the uh, time is a bit short, um, and because there are a lot of more design patterns to cover uh, and discuss, uh, I thought I will give you a list of other design patterns uh, that are, are, are out there. So I prepared here a table for you. Um, in the in the left, you can see the design pattern type, and on the on the right, you you can see the design pattern name. Uh, with a green check mark, I indicated the design patterns that uh, I have presented today. Uh, I will pause for a few moments so you can read uh, to the list. Oh, these design patterns are quite interesting and useful, but like I said, we don't have too much time to cover them all. And here is the rest of them. Uh, again, pausing for a few moments. All right. Now let us um, come or draw some conclusion regarding design patterns in uh, in general and also in machine learning. So it is always good to have some standards and proven solution. You may know that already uh, because, uh, and yeah, design patterns definitely provide this aspect. Um, but it is also uh, useful because design patterns save a lot of time. Um, another benefit would be you can learn only what you need. Like here in my presentation, I only picked some of the design patterns and you could easily take that design pattern and apply it to your specific problem without knowing about <clears throat> the others. But I think it's, it's, it's uh, good to have an overview of all. So you know what it's out there. Um, also a benefit of design pattern is that they improve communication with, uh, within the AI communities. 
between uh, colleagues. Um, they refer and when in the discussion to the same uh, topics. Um, improve improve ML solution by making them more robust, maintaining them scalable, and hopefully uh, they yield uh, more success uh, successful project. Um, just one minute more. Um, this presentation was based on a great book that I have recently read, and it's uh, the and it is in the second citation here. It's a very nice uh, book for machine learning practitioners, and I strongly recommend it to anyone in the interesting in the topic. Um, in general, in this presentation, I wanted to introduce and explain you <clears throat> the concept of design patterns in the ML domain. Uh, be, because uh, like we saw in the conclusion, I think it's uh, very important and it's uh, good to have them in certain scenarios. <clears throat> this was everything on my side. I want to thank you all for listening. And now we, uh, I'm going to answer your questions. Thank you, Dan. Very nice presentation. Uh, and yeah, I agree. Patterns uh, are great uh, when you have them. Uh, instead of reinventing the wheel <laughs> every time, it's good to use the, some uh, proven, uh, let's say, solutions. Um, we have a question in the group. What would be your approach for grouped time series prediction? Good questions. Group time series prediction. Maybe it's a bit uh, lacking a few details to that, but um, from <laughs> a bit of context, but uh, in general, you you could um, uh, use the the design pattern that I, I presented here, the multimodal input. Even even uh, if you have the same input, basically, you can do that. Absolutely do that. I mean, you you could not necessarily take one image. You could take multiple images. Also, in the uh, here, in the case of uh, multiple. Uh, time series. You could uh, give the time series uh, each uh, uh, separately, so to say. Um, I think that's one approach. Uh, not sure if another one would be, and I don't quite have too much experience on that, but maybe you could uh, somehow generate um, from the group uh, or pick a representative time series or somehow do a, a, a median of all of the candidates in the group and use that for uh, the input to the model. Uh, I will see these two uh, ways of doing it. Maybe it's uh, answering uh, the question here. Thanks. And uh, I have one question. Which one of these patterns that you presented would you recommend for somebody that's just starting, let's say, this field, right? He's approaching well, the ML space for the first yeah. time. Okay, good question. Uh, well, I would recommend um, um, as a general advice to go uh, to take the ML flow and try to. Um, uh, get as uh, to learn the uh, as much as possible in each stages, and in this manner, I would recommend maybe uh, picking the embedding one. So the embeddings, it's a very very used design pattern, and it's in the core of the majority of of uh, modern ML deep learning ML models, um, and maybe after that. Uh, Another very also important uh, design pattern is the reframing one because you have, yeah, how you tackle the problem really. That's why it's also important. So I will give <laughs> to <it> this time. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> even yeah. even uh, to at least our colleagues uh, that uh, and are new for, for in this field can can know how what to focus on. Yeah. Cool. Uh, if there are no more questions, I see there are no more questions. Thank you, Dan, for the, the great presentation. Uh, yeah. Please provide feedback to Dan. Um, and um, 
see you in 15 minutes with another uh, AI presentation. So see you soon, guys and girls. Thank, Thank you, you, guys. Thank you for having you here. Bye.